Hello, everyone. Welcome to Factors.ai podcast. Here we interview leaders, founders, and senior marketers and B2B SaaS companies about all things revenue and marketing. Today, we have a very, very, very special guest, Chris Sendoso, one of the leading direct marketing automation platforms. Uh, he's both a friend and advisor to us, and he's one of the top leaders in B2B and SaaS, which we always, which we at Factors.ai follow. And we are very excited to have him here. Welcome, Chris. Thanks a lot thank for me. Thank you. Excited to be on the show today. Sure. Chris, I mean, in our side, we don't need an introduction to you uh, from b 2 b SaaS. But if you can briefly take a couple of minutes to tell us about your story and how the idea of Sendoso came about. Yeah, for sure. So I started Sendoso about six and a half years ago. And prior to that, I spent about a decade in software sales. And so I really saw firsthand the evolution of outbound prospecting. You know, this was way back in the day when, you know, Tout app first came out and Yesware was one of the first sales engagement platforms. And it was also when SalesLoft at that time was a prospecting tool that helped you get email addresses out of LinkedIn. This was before they pivoted into the Perfect. into what we all know today with, with sales locked and outreach and everyone else in the sales engagement ca category. But so I saw those, you know, developments firsthand. And I, you know, way back in the day, I felt like you could send a hundred emails and get 90 replies. It was like, you know, everyone replied to email, but it got really saturated and noisy. And especially in B2B tech sales, it's really important that you're multi-threaded and that you're using multiple channels in order to get in front of your prospects and customers. And so I started to see uh, more and more digital noise come through from emails and ads. And I said, hey, how else can I stand out? How else can I get more creative with my outreach and, and, and try to break into new accounts? And so I started writing handwritten notes and sending those out to prospects. I'd be on a call and hear a dog bark and I'd send over a dog toy. Or I'd you know, go grab swag out of the, the marketing closet and, and ship it over to a prospect. And it all worked really, really well. It was just manual and time consuming and hard to track. You know, my VP was always like, why are you expensing Amazon? I'm like, it's because I bought this dog toy gift for this prospect. And then they replied and I got the meeting, closed the deal. He's like, I guess if it works, it works. And so I really just dreamed up of a solution that automated and made that whole process simpler and easier. And that was really the, you know, the concept of Sendoso that we all use today. I mean, when I think about it now, this just screams at you saying that, okay, this is so obvious. People have to use it because emails are like less than 1% replies goes always mm -hmm. in the spam. But how was it in the early days? I mean, your co-founder and you selling early, was it immediate product market fit or did it take some time? When did the tech happen? What was the yeah. journey at that point in time? So, you know, I think we, I think we were lucky in that we were selling to ourselves in a sense, I mean, like my co-founder was also in sales. And so we knew what we wanted and we knew how we wanted to use the product. So we were like our own users and we were solving the problem for ourselves. So that was helpful in terms of like, we, we felt we had product market fit for ourselves. So then it was like, okay, now how else do we go out there and find others? And I think the concept of what we're doing has been done, you know, years and decades before it was just so manual and automated that we are manual and siloed that because we were able to create a software platform a marketplace a logistics network it was kind of an aha moment for our prospects where they said hey i do this manually or i want to do this more this is amazing so we it, it was less like we invented a brand new category we just built a better mousetrap on an existing category where technology makes it a gazillion times better. And I kind of think about it synonymous maybe to the, the Uber to taxi scenario where people were using taxis as transportation, everyone was using it. But then once you layer on an app like Uber, it's just a million times better. And, and they were stealing all those taxi dollars away. That's very interesting and kind of like Yet another Uber analogies, I've seen a lot on B2C, but Uber analogy in B2B, this is the first time I'm hearing of it. Uh, that's amazing. And uh, like right from seed funding to Series A to this thing. How did you start with your go-to-market? Of course, you and your co-founder both were sales people, so you would have yep. started with sales. But how did the non-linear aspect happen in terms of marketing? Who was your first marketing hire? How did you think about marketing in the early days and how has it evolved in Centoso over the last couple of years? 
Yeah. So in the early days, I think marketing was extremely important, both from a brand awareness perspective and then also from a demand gen perspective. And I think those are the two areas that we focused on first. So we, our first marketer, she was amazing. She was kind of a, you know, a, she, she did everything. So she was helping create sales and enablement content. She was doing field marketing events and we'd show up at conferences and we'd invite our, you know, our whole company at the time, which maybe there was eight of us and we'd all show up to a conference and be like, wow, Zenosa is huge. And we're like, this is their whole company if they only knew. But we were, you know, kind of fake it till you make it kind of mentality where you want to show up big at these conferences. And then we did, you know, a lot of your traditional demand gen, content marketing, and, and really went down that path really strong too. And so I think we, we early on invested in marketing, I think ahead of other, I think mar our marketer was maybe our sixth hire. And so we pretty quickly uh, decided we want to make sure that we, one, drive enough leads for sales. Um, we also quickly hired SDRs as an extension of marketing. So from day one, we had like an SDR or, or we had our, our first sales hired. Then we hired some SDRs shortly thereafter because we had a, a bunch of marketing leads coming in too. So, you know, within our first, you know, 10 employees, there was an SDR in that group. So we were, were quickly will, willing to build this outbound engine that consisted of marketing, demand gen, and and then the SDR organization. And what was the scale of investment in terms of what percentage of your revenue you invested back into marketing and how did you actually scale that up over the period of time? Yeah. yeah so, you know, we, I think we are maybe spending, it's hard for me to remember back in the day in terms of the exact amounts, but I think we, our, our goal was like, let's overspend in marketing in the beginning. And we had a revenue model that was driving revenue to a point where we were actually profitable or break even in the early days, in the early years. We went out and raised money just so that we could scale faster. But we had a very strong business model. I think when we went to raise our Series A, we had over 5 million in ARR already. Even our seed round, we had more than a million in ARR. So we were pretty quick to drive revenue day zero, which came from you know, myself and my co-founder's ability to just to go out there and sell, 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 then hire salespeople that could sell, 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 hire marketers that could drive pipeline and leads and sell, sell, sell. And so we were selling day zero. And, and that was part of our DNA in the early years. One thing which is kind of surprising and also how it worked, both you yeah. and your co-founder were salespeople. No product, yes. <laughs> no tech, no marketing, but salespeople. Yes. How did you make it work in the early days as two salespeople getting together and then building the product, then the tech and then the marketing muscle around that? Yeah. So, you know, I think as, as part of that background, I mean, like I said, it very much helped for our go-to-market strategy. We were both selling day zero. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, I took on the challenge of how am I going to really manage the rest of the business? And so I, you know, took on how to develop products, how to manage engineering teams, how to manage marketing and all the other aspects of the business. We quickly hired a COO pretty early and that was helpful to take on a lot of the operations, the HR, the legal, the finance side of things. So, so that was something that, you know, was, was far out of my wheelhouse, but I had familiarity working at other startups in terms of like how, how to develop products. And, you know, I was very early at other startups that were, you know, I was a third employee at another startup that scaled and I was the like 12th employee at another car startup that scaled. So I saw oh. how it, how a startup That's worked good. from the inside out and just used that as kind of the building blocks for what I wanted to build. Awesome. And I mean, we saw in the seed stage and you had the CDZ at 5 million. What was the growth from, I mean, how did you handle growth from 5 to 10 and then further into the SoftBank funding level? What were the things which worked for you? What are the growth hacks? both from a sales and marketing front and even customer success front, which really worked for you. you know, these yeah. Things. So, you know, I think some of the things were, you know, the more traditional things. I think one of the things we did was just, we invested very, very heavily in an SDR organization early on. And that was something that I think some people kind of tiptoe into, but we were like, let's go all in on the SDR organization, which also meant that we had to go all in on our rev ops and how we find named accounts. So we really uh, gave the SDRs all their named accounts, all the contacts, 
and they focus most of their time just on cold calling, sendosoing, and sequencing, replying to emails. And so that was important. So we had a big emphasis on data and our Salesforce efforts. We had a big emphasis on our SDR efforts. And then we were doing a ton of marketing thought leadership in the early days. We had an amazing early content marketer that was creating a lot of awareness for Sendoso out there. We also like, you know, caught a lot of great trends and movements in marketing. We were very early on in account-based marketing, ABM, and that was something that was really relevant to us. And, and so we were really rode that way really well. And we really did a lot with integrations. We had a lot of partnerships through all of the different SaaS, MarTech and sales tech companies. So we always co-sold with them or co-marketed. That was a huge early win for us as we got to put our name next to the, the HubSpots and Marketos and Salesforces and Outreach and sales lofts, sales lofts of the early days and, you know, ride off their coattails. We, we got really good at, you know, building a culture of winning and I think building a team that we could you know, repeat our sales efforts on. And so it was just how quick, how can we just hire more smart salespeople, build a sales engine and just continue to scale that. Awesome. That's kind of something like almost every startup founder would like to walk that path <laughs> down the line and the thing. But in early days and also in the mid stages, of course, it's like super high growth and there is kind of exponential. There's a lot of investor interest, everything. But uh, metrics sometimes gets forgotten. But I mean, people who build big companies look at metrics as well. They look at what are the kind of metrics, both revenue metrics, marketing metrics, customer success metrics, which matter. As a CEO, as you progress through the road, what were the kind of metrics you were really keeping a watch with at different stages and both from a revenue and marketing lens, if you can share that, that would be great. Yeah, you know, I'll share a couple that I'd say I watched closely and some I wish I watched closer. So, you know, I think ARR was just like my North Star. I was constantly like, great, we closed another deal. How much ARR? How much ARR? How much ARR? And so I was overly obsessed with ARR. I think, you know, that metric is very glorified in Silicon Valley and SaaS tech companies is like ARR is the best thing in the world. And so I think I overly indexed on ARR. You know, I think the area that I, would looking back on, I, I would say NRR it is even a, a metric that I think is is equally or more important as it shows really the health of the customer retention side of the business and expansion side of the business. And so, you know, we, we over glorified, I think the new business AEs and were less highlighting and focused on the account management expansion deals and, and the land and expand process. We've now solved that and we've now, you know, our, our focus on that. But in the, in the early years, the first one, two, three, even four years, it was so much more of a focus on ARR than anything else. Right. I think that was a big one. We'd, you know, I think another focus area was, you know, that we looked at was really spend on our platform. That is a unique thing for us because it's like a leading indicator of usage and adoption. I think other companies will find what their like magic usage and adoption metric is. And, you know, there's some formulaic ways that we could figure out like how much spend then, you know, assimilates to the likelihood to renew or expand. And so I think it's really important for each company to figure out what is their usage and adoption metric and really hone in on that and really make sure that you know that and double down on that. Awesome. Um, and I think that's an important one. And uh, with regard to marketing metrics, did you have a tab on CAC? Or did you have a tab on ROI with marketing investment and attribution on marketing investment? Was that something which you looked at? At which stage you started looking at it and when did it become more and more important for you? Yeah. So I think marketing obsessed over that really well. They were looking at a little less on the, we weren't obsessing over LTV to CAC in the early days, just because we had a fast growing business with tons of capital and tons of growth. I think now as we're a little bit more focused on a path to profitability, that is even more important and something that probably is, should be equally important to all companies at all stages, given the current climates and environment. I think we looked at attribution as best we could. I think it's one of those things, unless you are able to buy a tool, like factors, it, it becomes harder to 
to look at over time. And so we would have very much benefited from factors in the early years. I think the benefit of that is where you, you know, there was a bit of time where we had, where we were kind of had some gray area in terms of our reporting for attribution. And so it was like, where do we invest it? And it was a bit of hope, hope and wish strategy than like a data-driven strategy. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so that was something that I think as a, as an early startup or, or any size company, if you can showcase what attribution from what channel, from what source, you're going to be able to invest more in those sources and more in those channels. And that's incredibly important, especially, especially in today's kind of more budget tight economy that we're in. We did look at like pipeline, you know, velocity and pipeline coverage and those type of kind of more sales and marketing alignment metrics. That was really important for us too. Awesome. And I mean, this is a lot about a lot to digest for almost every other SaaS founder and B2B marketer, both from the early stages, SDR investment, ABM investment, content and building for growth and the team structure. But now we'll go into what Sendoso does, gifting. Gifting is, I mean, for me, it's obvious, but a lot of people, we do see a lot of LinkedIn posts. We do see a couple of people saying that, okay, why would anyone buy a gift for to get a door opener? If the person is really interested, he's going to come to us. But you have seen it right from the start to end. How does gifting work and how does it generate revenue? What are the kind of nuances of gifting is something which we want to learn about. Totally. So I think of gifting in a couple of different ways. One, I think gifting as a, as just another communication medium at the very high level. It's, hey, you're, you're trying to reach out, you're trying to grab the attention and you're trying to communicate to a prospect, to a customer, to a partner, and in some cases to an employee, but we'll leave out the employee use case now and just talk about kind of more customer prospect driven gifting. And so you have a lot of different ways that you could do that. You can send an SMS, you can give them a cold call, you can shoot them a note on LinkedIn, you can email them, and you can also send them a gift. And so all these different channels are just increasing your likelihood that they're going to reply, that they're going to engage, that they're going to be more interested in learning about your product or service. And so I think of it as just another tool in your tool belt. I I think gifting is complementary to the other channels that you're currently using. It can work better than other channels in a lot of cases because of the, just the intrinsic value of giving something to somebody. There's that reciprocity. There's also just the incentivization and the, the feeling of, hey, I've got to return this favor. So built into gifting is just some psychological benefits that are, you know, when someone sends you an email, you're not like, oh, I've got to respond. Or when you see an ad and click on it, you're like, oh, I got to go buy their product right now. Like that's just psychologically not the way humans think. but There is some psychological understanding that when you send someone a gift, that there is some sort of of effort that you should return that favor, especially if it's a thoughtful, personalized, customized, unique gift with a unique handwritten note or custom message next to it. So that being said, I like to think of it as just what what are what is, you know, a goal that a a business has and, and what is in some cases I call them leaky buckets. Do you need to go and solve more? top of funnel leads into your pipeline? Do you need to drive more attendees to a webinar? Do you need to drive more show rates to SDR set uh, AE meeting? Do you need to accelerate your deal pipeline? Do you need to welcome a customer with a customer gift? Do you need to, you know, all these different areas, you can add in gifting to that mix to drive conversion and almost act as a multiplier. I like to think of that, you know, you, you have a, a bigger chance, you know, to engage with a prospect and get their attention if you use gifting in your strategies. Oh, that's, I think, very well articulated as a communication medium. And I think thinking back, I was one thing which I was thinking was like in early days when, I mean, I was talking about early 2000s when an email used to come, everyone used to get excited because I've got an email, I have to reply. And then the novelty fell off because we had the email automation and spam yes. and everything coming up. But gifting is also, if it's a thoughtful gift, or even if it's a thoughtful written well email, people have that reciprocity to actually sure. uh, uh, yes. return back and they don't see it as a bribe or any other form. But going a little more into details and how companies do it, at what stage or I mean, in terms of either ARR or growth stage and other thing, do companies should adopt a gifting product like Sendoso and what you have seen from data from within Sendoso itself and at 
what stage of buying process is it at top of the funnel or is it at the middle of the funnel or which touch point because we have the email sequencing and the abm sequencing like 17 step 15 step mm -hmm. 20 step process which steps of the process does the gifting actually makes a lot of sense in terms of conversions yeah so i'm a big proponent that gifting should be there day zero if you're two founders in a garage trying to build a product and figure out product market fit what what is your goal your goal is to try to talk to customers and build some early traction to get feedback on your product to see if someone's willing to use your product and willing to pay for your product so what are you doing you're doing customer interviews you're doing you know you're reaching out to friends asking for, for referrals and what what perfect way to say hey thank you for that customer interview or hey thank you for giving me your feedback and building those early customer champions and ambassadors that hopefully will be customers for life for the next decade and so even when you're two founders trying to find product market fit, there's a benefit to gifting. Now, that being said, you know, the Sendoso Enterprise product has a million more bells and whistles than would be needed for a two-person startup. But we do have a free Sendoso Express product that you can get in there, sign up and send something with, you know, no SaaS fee and get going in one minute and send someone a gift. But we then also have the product that the 10,000 person sales team needs with rules and permissions and limitations and integrations and automations and something that a, you know, multi-billion dollar, you know, global conglomerate would need too. So I think there's a different software platform that can be leveraged depending on the stage of your company, but the intrinsic value that gifting delivers can be done at a two-person startup to a, you know, 50,000 person startup. So, so that's my answer to that question. To the second part of like what step in the sequence, I think it's more of a, you know, a experimentation process than it is just like every, you know, step two, you have to do it. And, the, and what I say is more important is how do you think about the overall like buyer's journey and how are you tying those steps together? If you just randomly out of the blue stage seven, just sent someone a gift and didn't mention that in stage eight, like, or step eight, like that, is, that might, you know, fall short. So I think the best, you know, outbound prospecting reps, whether you're an SDR or an AE prospecting, you've integrated into your sales engagement tools, like, you know, like the sale, like sales loft or HubSpot or Groove or Apollo or, 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 you know, any of these tools so that you can build a repetition around what step. And then you also have the ability to track what step is converting better. You can do A-B testing. And then all that just goes to show you that, hey, for, for our audience, for this product line, for this ICP, we're seeing the best step three versus step 12. And, and uh, you know, a lot of companies have multiple steps. Money. You'll try, you know, early in the process, later in the process. It's, you know, how again do you do email and cold calls and gifting and social all, you know, interconnected to get someone's attention? That's great. I mean, as a fundamental product with attribution, but underlying is the customer buyer journey is what we stitch together. And since we also integrate with HubSpot and Salesforce and other sales engagement tools, which are there, we are also seeing the paths and which part where the gifting happens, where the user, what was the inflection point around it, how many users got gifted and what did they do after it? Did the deal accelerate or how it moved from SQL to close one, et cetera, is something which we are also seeing. So that's pretty exciting for us. Maybe we'd have some more data to share with you in a couple of weeks or months in time. That's something which we are looking forward to. One more thing which I wanted to ask when you had spoken about earlier, you measure one that's like, how is the volume of spends do people use on the Sendoso platform? That's something. And more the spends, it means there's a lot of engagement. They are seeing value. How do customers look at ROI from Sendos? From the yeah. gift and how do they measure that? Yep. So there's you know a handful of different ways companies look at ROI. One is the they look they finally get to look at the ROI of direct mail as the channel. Previously, companies might be doing this manually, and they're not even able to see that. Hey, we spend you know eight thousand dollars on this campaign, and it influenced you know two million dollars of pipe. So they're tracking the ROI of the channel and doing so through usually like a weighted average or a last touch or, you know, their own attribution modeling. Furthermore, there's ROI of doing more. And so if they're trying to have an in-house team, pack boxes, send, send stuff out, you know, typically an AE or even a demand gen marketer only has a certain number of hours in their day. And so they end up doing just this, the smallest amount when they can just click a button or set up an automation and 
gifts and direct mail goes out, they could do a lot more. So there's the ROI and the opportunity cost of not doing enough of direct mail. There's also the ROI of the cost of goods sold. So because we have these economies of scale, because we can go out and say, hey, we're buying tens of millions or hundreds of millions of dollars of product, we can go get discounts and pass those discounts along to our customers. So they pay less than market rate for products and, and postage, et cetera. And so there's just the ROI of the, the campaign itself. Was there any incrementality test done within Sendoso or something like pre-Sendoso to after Sendoso? How much was the, let's say, deal cycle velocity increase or in terms of ACV increase or any other number of deals increased? Listen, any other? For sure. Yeah. I mean, we, we don't, we, we help our customers track all that data. We help them set up custom dashboards. A lot of times, like I said, we're not the only touch point in their outbound cycle or their, their deal acceleration or their customer retention uh, programs. And so our goal is to be another data point that they can then paint the picture of what's true attribution, what's the true ROI points, what are the true conversion metrics. And they're able to do that in their own systems, their own dashboards. Awesome. Now let's move away from metrics. Just saying, uh, I mean, gifting is one of the most creative forms of communication in some level, because you can get as creative as possible. It's not like yeah. email is always a standard template. It can't, I can put a meme in it. I can put an animation in it, but it stands like that. I can create a write as much as possible, but gifting can be as creative as possible. What were the most creative gifts you have seen your customers ask you to ship out? Yeah. So, you know, we have a really unique integration with Amazon where you can go and search Amazon's 500 million products and then it ships, it uses your Sendoso account balance, ships to our nearest warehouse. We then unbox it, rebox it, add a handwritten note and ship it out, all tracked through your CRM or your, your sales engagement tools. And so because of that, we're able to we're able to customize the gift to anything. You know, it's typically like my, my example of a dog barking in the background and you send a dog toy, like that type of personal connection and message or, you know, someone's alma mater or they mention they're going on a ski trip or, you know, it's very much personalized to that person. And I think that can be very memorable. So any memorable gifts you have sent out or you have received? Yeah. I mean, one of the ones from way back in the day, we, we were at a conference and somebody was on crutches and had a, some broken ribs from a, from a snowboarding accident. And we had shipped them a, a rack of ribs in the mail back to the house. And so that was, and with a funny handwritten note talking about it. And we thought that that worked really well, got the meeting, got the deal and was pretty creative. One last thing, of course, it's like while we see, I mean, B2B software is more software. We see a dashboard, we see a kind of a gifting platform and ACV and the dashboard tracking the gifts and the thing. What is the people ops behind it? Because there is a lot more physical, logistical ops, which goes, right? What is the kind of complexity about it? Number of people involved in getting one gift or a gifting platform run, running? What, what yeah, happens? So, so we have hundreds and hundreds of employees in different warehouses or what we call our SFC, our sending fulfillment centers around the globe that are working night and day to, you know, receive products, pack boxes, kit products, include handwritten notes, the whole process. It's, it's amazing to see our largest warehouse in Phoenix is hundreds of thousands of square feet, just a massive facility that houses our customers swag and gifts and, and our processes. And, you know, we do major kidding projects and everything else. So there's so much that goes on behind the scenes from the sourcing, the procurement, the supply chain, the, sh the packing of boxes, the, the QA to make sure everything's perfect, the, you know, the logistics, the customs, the clearance, everything behind the scenes that you don't think about. You just click a button and it magically appears in your prospect's desk. But you know, we do a lot behind the scenes to make it happen. Well, it's dizzying. I mean, in software, we raise a Jira ticket if anything goes wrong, but here <laughs> yeah. something goes wrong. It's a lot more in operations and returns and other aspects about it. That's pretty exciting and a lot to learn across gifting and the operation behind gifting. One last question around the gifting. Now, send also does gift globally. How does, how do you handle regional or cultural variances? How do gifts get perceived in Europe versus APAC? Japan, Southeast Asia, South Asia, et cetera, or in North America itself. Any comments on that or any learnings from that over a period of time? 
Yeah. So, you know, I think you definitely want to have cultural sensitivity and locational sensitivity when you're thinking about gifting because you want to make sure you're sending the right type of gift to the right person. And so whether that's, you know, understanding local cultures, we have suggested recommendations based on location. So we help in that process too. But it's definitely important to think about regions, what you should send and, you know, sensitivities to different cultures. And this is the last serious question before we wind sure. down into the non-serious questions. It's a difficult market now. I think it might be a, it's been a difficult market for the last couple of quarters, but we may be for another couple of quarters. But the same. What are the B2B marketing trends and ABM trends which you are seeing in the next couple of quarters? And uh, that's something which we want to learn about. Yeah, I'd say the, the few that I'm seeing, one is just the, the major focus on your customers more than ever. How are you doing full funnel marketing and really marketing to your customers more than ever than just thinking about it as more of a demand gen approach? I think that's the biggest one. Two, I think there's just a, a big trend towards how do you prioritize which accounts to go after? I think there's a bigger focus now that you don't have infinite people and infinite dollars. How do you prioritize where you spend your money and who you spend your money on? So I think that's important. And then I think there's still the overarching trend of this, you know, it's harder than ever to get people's attention. And, and how do you break through that noise in a creative way? Got it. And one more thing with regard to the market and also how you are expanding around in the market, any advice for startup founders and also series A, series B companies, like how do they, given your lengthy journey, you would have, this is maybe the second cycle which you would have seen. So any mm -hmm. experiences from your past into what early stage founders can do? in terms of handling you know, this market? I think a couple of things. One is, you know, I think make sure you're not, you're still investing in, in marketing and sales and customer success. Like even in downturns, now still time to get revenue. Use this time where there's maybe to, to go back and figure out where, what processes need to be built so you can get ready to scale again faster. So make sure all of your systems, all of your processes are ready to, to get back to scaling mode once the economy starts roaring again. And, you know, I think this is, this is a marathon, not a sprint. So make sure you're, you're in it for the long haul. Thanks a lot for that. That's been pretty helpful. So now anything about B2B marketing, founders, SaaS, gifting, that's done. The last set of questions is something which we want to learn more personally about things, questions which we can share and other person. Can you name one favorite leader of your sport? Yeah. I know it's a controversial one, but I love Elon Musk. I think he, it's fascinating what he's building with SpaceX and everything else. It just feels like he's thinking, you know, 50 years ahead of the future. So I, I admire even some of the Twitter stuff I'm, I, I maybe disagree with in his, that, that, that situation, but he's probably got something he's thinking about 20 years ahead that no one knows about. So I admire his forward thinking leadership style. That's great. One other question which we wanted to ask is like, I mean, gently the question asks is always like, what advice you give to the youngsters who are just coming out of college? But given the times which we are in, and generally the world is also more into the middle age, which is there. What, and you have been a sales guy yourself and B2B SaaS salesperson, a content executive as well. What advice you would give to 15, 20 year experienced sales leaders, AEs and others? What would you tell them to do or upskill on so that they can, one, navigate this current turmoil or also going forward? Okay. I think my advice is just to, you know, continue to work hard, be agile. Like, you know, maybe what worked two years ago, what worked four years ago isn't going to work tomorrow. And just be, meet the moment and, you know, be, be ready to, you know, think creatively and, you know, maybe change your approach more often than not. Got it. And uh, the last question, and before we wind up the podcast, any favorite book and film? So funny enough, I don't watch a lot of movies. I watch more like YouTube and, and I listen to podcasts a lot more than I read books. So I'd say maybe I'll share a few of my favorite podcasts. So I love the Acquired podcast. Mm -hmm. um, I love the All In podcast. I love T the T-Boy podcast. Uh, cartoon avatar podcast. Those are some of my, and then my first million. So big podcast person. So those are I think four or five of my favorites. Awesome. That's great. 
I think you've been wonderful, Chris. Thanks a lot for sharing your insights on marketing, gifting, startup, founder stories, and metrics, and also with regard to your the podcast which you listen to as well. So, if we have to get into your mind, I think it's one way is to go through the podcast. So, thanks a lot for this, and thank you. You got it. See you later, Shri. Bye bye. Bye.